Each and every one stand. Stand fast. Stand sure. All right, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. All right, I've been asking some of y'all to join the choir, and guess what? All y'all going to be the choir this morning, all right? Last week's choir special, we were all fixing to sing. Now, if you're not familiar with it, just the words will be on the screen, and Amazing Grace is nestled in the middle of it. Now, I'm reminding the choir of this. We're all going to sing all parts, because there's a women's part and a men's part, but we're all going to sing both of them, right? All right. So if everybody's staying, Amazing Grace medley.
2 Timothy chapter 2. It'll be on the screens if you don't have your Bible with you. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul is writing to his son in the gospel, uh, Timothy, and he tells him, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard <clears throat> from me are among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who are able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ <clears throat> of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. They also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of things, char of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive without, about words, to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal, that the Lord knows who, those who are his, and let every soul who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And to serve the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And they, uh, and they that may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Amen. Brother Doyle, will you lead us in prayer? Fathers, we come to thee thanking you for the many blessings of life. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house today, dear Father. And thank you for our visitors that have chosen to worship with us this morning, dear Father. And I do thank you for bearing the cross for me, dear Father, as the song said. Father, we just thank you for your presence here this morning. Father, we ask your blessings upon the sick and the depressed, those uh, weak and aging, Father, in all capacities, those that need those special special needs we just ask that you bless each one of them bless this church as we start this church new year in a few days and it, uh, we may reach out with the with different programs and ideas to uh, reach the lost father we just ask your blessings there father we ask your blessings upon our farmers as it's approaching harvest season and entering harvest season that they may have a bountiful harvest to feed and clothe the world we ask your blessings upon our community and country, dear Father, the leaders of our country and the turmoil that we end, the internal affairs as well as the, the uh, uh, foreign affairs, Father, we just ask all aspects and give, give our leaders wisdom and knowledge to handle these situations to move forward. Again, as we come, come this morning to worship, we thank you for the choir this morning, their, their uh, uh, singing, dear Father, we thank you for the preaching and the praying. All these things we ask in your holy and precious name. Amen.
join this exciting choir. <coughs> Rehearsal is tonight after, after church. Now that we are trials for the choir, you like that? Your heart's got to be beating. You got to be breathing air. And you got to have the love of Jesus in the heart to sing praises like they sing. So anyway, trials <laughs> tonight for the choir. I'm just kidding. Just come up here and join us if you want to. All right, children, y'all come down. All right, is that better? Can you hear me better? All right, well, there's something pretty cool going on tomorrow. Anybody know what that is? You can blurt it out. Come on. Solar eclipse, yeah. That's pretty neat. Has anybody ever seen one? Yeah. I don't think I have either. I think there has been one in my lifetime. Am I wrong about that? But I didn't see it. If it was, there has been one. Well, there's one coming tomorrow, and this is something that us, about those guys but us we've never seen before i've never seen one so and it kind of got me thinking about all the cool stuff that we do see every day but we kind of see it so much we don't think it's so cool anymore like just the sun without the moon in front of it you know the sun's pretty awesome i mean that thing's pretty bright you can't look at it don't try what's that unless you have some special glasses that's right i've got me a special pair of glasses but but don't try, but it is pretty awesome, right? It lights up the whole world, right? Yeah, the moon by itself, that's pretty cool, ain't it? Ain't it neat how the, how the moon changes the way it looks every night? Yeah, sometimes you have a full moon and sometimes not so full, things like that. That's pretty awesome. What about the stars? We see the stars all the time, at least in this part of the country. We can walk outside and see the stars. Now, there are a lot of folks who live in the city. And they go outside and they see stars like only when they drive out into the country. They don't get to see the stars every night. They don't show up because there's so many city lights. And them it's pretty awesome. But to us, we kind of get used to it. We see billions of stars in the sky, right? And it just kind of, we don't pay them a lot of attention to it anymore, do we? But isn't it awesome when you think about it, how many stars there are? And there's so many and we can see them all over the sky. There's so many you never count them. Ain't that pretty cool? Just the fact that the sky is blue. Ain't that pretty awesome? Can you imagine if our sky was like green? Well, it's not blue. It's clear. With like reflecting something like that. Yeah. That's awesome if you know that. Ain't that even cooler? That we think it's blue, but not really. I mean, that's awesome. God works in some awesome ways, don't he? And so many of these ways go on every day that we don't pay attention to or we don't think about. But they are so awesome. Now, what's happening tomorrow, what's so cool about that is this is a display of God's awesomeness that we don't get to see every day. So take the opportunity and worship God for how awesome he is because he's showing us something that we don't, we don't get used to. We don't see it very often. Matter of fact, I'm 30-something, and I've never seen one. Okay, let me read you a Bible verse. I want you to, I want you to understand something about the eclipse tomorrow. All right, this, is, this comes out of Psalms chapter 19, and it's verse 1, and it says this. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming his handiwork. What you're seeing tomorrow, or what you might see on the Internet or something like that, if you choose not to watch it outside, some of us aren't going to. But what's going to happen tomorrow is nothing short of the universe glorifying God. That's what it, the Bible says. Everything that goes on, in the heavens, every awesome thing you see around you is built to glorify God and show how awesome he is. So whether you watch it online or you go outside and you have your special glasses and look up at it, while you're looking at it, I want you to think about how awesome our God is. Okay? Let's say a prayer and thank you for that. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you that tomorrow we get to witness something that a whole lot of people have never seen before, Lord. And we just think that's so cool. Lord, we, we thank you that we get to go outside or we get to look online or on our TVs and we get to see a uh, maybe once or twice uh, in a lifetime opportunity to see something so awesome as an eclipse, Lord. 
may it remind us of all the awesome things that you do every day, Lord, that we are, that we get used to. And although it's wrong, Lord, we should walk outside every day and glorify your name for how awesome the world is and how awesome your creation is, Lord. But God, may this eclipse help remind us that you are that awesome. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, for off to our hymn, it is, is, uh, it is Well in My Soul, it's number 705. If you were here last Sunday at 5 o'clock, we went through a series of uh, a film that, or they don't have films anymore, but anyway, DVD of, of, of hymns and what they meant to people and who wrote them. Well, this man here was a Chicago businessman. He lost his whole business in a fire, in the Chicago fire. He put his three or four daughters on a ship to go to Europe. Uh, it sank, he lost his daughters. All he had was his wife, and he could still sing It Is Well in My Soul. You know, could we do that nowadays? If somehow Flint Equipment burned up this afternoon and Chris Cannon come out and said, look, we're not going to rebuild, you don't have a job. If Dale and Emily and, and, and Richard got killed in a car wreck this afternoon, could I say it as well in my soul? That takes a strong man to do that. But let's sing it. Number 705, it is well in my soul. Let's all stand.
and all activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. of Antioch Baptist Church is in all activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. Sound people, musicians, for leading us in worship to this place. As you heard this morning in our choir special, we had one of our newer members of our choir uh, help us in singing our uh, special this morning, and uh, Amanda did a great job. You would have not have known it from listening that she was nervous at all, uh, but uh, she did a great job, and we thank her for doing so this morning. And you too can come and join the choir. Uh, Charlie, we will not tell them that they will have to sing a special, though they might. And uh, so uh, you come and join with us and uh, be part of our choir, and we promise you we'll make you welcome and allow you to be part from the very beginning. All right, take your Bibles now and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to pick up reading in verse 21. I have the uh, task this morning. I'm going to try to preach three sermons in one and get you all out on time. There are three distinct sermons in the... Well, uh, the, in the introduction, which is the passages right before this, and these verses this morning. So uh, if you will help, we will see if we can't uh, uh, make them all come together and be part of a, a reasonable sermon for you this morning. Matthew chapter 16, if you found that in your copy of Scripture, if you have it, it's on the board in front of you. Please stand as I read this passage for us this morning. Matthew writes and records for us. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. <clears throat> we are in the course of walking through the life of Jesus in a time-dated fashion or chronologically. We are now in the last year of his life. He is presently at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is the northernmost part of the territory of Israel. It's in the uh, tribe of Dan. Uh, Caesarea Philippi had been a idolatrous uh, uh, city. It had been renamed for Caesar and for Philip, uh, Herod Philip. And uh, now Jesus has taken his disciples up to that place. He is beginning to teach them the truth that they need to see and understand, and that is that his day is coming that has been determined by his Father. Uh, he is uh, soon to uh, be offered as a sacrifice for the sins of the world upon the cross of Calvary. Now, in the preceding verses, immediate verses, uh, he has been asked uh, and asked the question, uh, who men say he is and uh, what do they think? He's asked the disciples what they think. And now he's told the disciples, based upon the statement that Peter had made, uh, that he would build his church. It's important for us to gather that in our uh, message this morning, is that Jesus is now presenting the reason for him coming to earth. 
He had been prophesied in the Old Testament. Promises had been made. And those promises yet, uh, he knows, and we now know, are at least 2,000 years in the future. He has promised to come and redeem Israel and make a place for them, set the throne of David up. All those things are yet to happen. But in a period of time, in an intermediate period of time, is going to be this wonderful place, uh, this wonderful uh, dispensation called the age of the church. You and I live in that age right now. And in that age, he is going to call out whosoever will. He's going to call out a body, a bride, a group of folks uh, unto himself that will be saved by the amazing grace of God. We sang about that here just a few minutes ago. And uh, now he must teach his disciples and us how that age is going to take place. It is something that this world had no knowledge of. It was a mystery hidden in God in Christ. And so he begins to tell them, he says, Now I want you to know, disciples, I am going to build my church. It is amazing when you look at that, and this is a message, and I'm only going to give you just a brief glimpse of what that message is. Uh, at points in time we'll be doing. He was in an area called Caesarea Philippi. Right above it was in a town called Damascus. Uh, Damascus uh, is an a, is a old village that has been there for, for many years. Many folks say uh, that it is the oldest inhabited city, continuously inhabited city on planet Earth. And by most measures, uh, it is. They would come four or five years, six years later, as Christ had died and uh, risen again, as he's going to tell us here in a few minutes, a great persecution of this church that he was building. And out of the Jewish faith, God was going to call the most ardent critic of Jesus Christ ever. It was a man named Saul. You would come to know him if you study the Bible as the Apostle Paul. And God was going to call him out to build his church, specifically the Gentile part of the church. Now, if you're not a church person, if you, and I don't, I don't mean that, uh, don't come to church. I mean, if all these terms doesn't mean anything to you, let me define them just a little bit for you. Jews were those that were born of the Jewish faith, of uh, the line of Abraham and Jacob and after them, and formed those folks that lived in, in Israel today. Uh, the area of Israel. Separate from them were another group of folks called Gentiles or heathens. And guess who the Gentiles and heathens are? Us. If you are not of the Jewish faith, and you may be here this morning, I, I don't know, probably not, the majority if not all of us, are rightly called heathens. And looking at some of you, And you might say, looking at you, preacher, we are Gentiles or heathens. And the Bible says, without Christ, we were outside the commonwealth. We were outside saving grace. But God loved us, and he sent his one and only son. And that son died, rose again. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And he called out this fellow named Saul, who would become Paul. And uh, he was causing great persecution on the church. He had done as much damage as he thought he could at Jerusalem, so he asked the elders, can I go to Damascus? Now that's the reason I mentioned this morning, because where Jesus is standing with his disciples and going to give them this truth, he was near Damascus. And no doubt the Lord knew that one day, not too far distant from the time he was talking, that this very person, Saul, was going to come along and anger and hatred and malice was going to be in his heart. And he had letters from Jerusalem to gather up as much of those Christians, in his mind, heathens and Gentiles, and bring them and have them judged uh, before him. And uh, so he was on his way to Damascus, and he was going to persecute those there. And by the way, most of those at that time would have been, if not all, Jews. And they had come to know Jesus. And on that road somewhere, uh, according to uh, the ninth chapter of Book Acts, he was near Damascus. So somewhere between Caesarea Philippi and Damascus, the Lord came and spoke to Saul. He said, Saul, I've got a job for you. I'm building a church. And I want you to 
come to know me as Savior, and I want you to take the glorious gospel, and I want you to go teaching Gentiles. I want to tell you, the most unlikely person in the world to do it, but yet God is God. And what is impossible with men is possible with God. And God came and called this on fire prosecutor of the church and changed his heart, and he became just as zealous to go out and reach men and women for Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, I tell you that brief story to tell you when Jesus says he's going to build his church, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, Jesus is in the church building business. He's not building buildings, so he helps us do that. He's building men and women. He's calling out unlikely people to come and be part of the family of God. That's what's wonderful about being a preacher. I don't have to look out there and say, man, Brother Byron, I love to pick on this man. He deserves every minute of it. Can I get amen, Brother Doyle? <laughs> He didn't look at him. Man, you look like the most outstanding, outstanding, wonderful person. I'd love to have this person in my church. I can't think of a better person to come to know Jesus as Savior as Brother, uh, as brother Byron. Though Brother Byron is those things. I'm, that's not how God looks at it. God looks, and he looks at Craig. You're okay, Richard. He looks at Craig. <laughs> Craig came to our church across the street, and he didn't come because he wanted to come to church. He didn't come because he wanted to be saved. He didn't come because he wanted to be a child of God. He came because his family drugged him. He was drugged to church. His little girl was doing stuff at church. And God didn't look out there and say, I'm looking for the prettiest or the best or the brightest or the most knowledgeable of Scripture. He looked out and said, Craig, I want you. And you know who the most astonished person besides the preacher in the room was? Because I looked down, I saw a big old trucker. He could come up that stage and wallop me pretty good. But God looked and said, I'm looking for folks that the rest of the world's not looking for. I'm looking for folks that when they come to know me, they know they've had a good old-fashioned dose of Jesus. That's who he's looking for. I want to tell you, he's looking for folks that think they can't be found. He's looking for folks that don't want to be found. Paul wasn't looking to be found. He wasn't lost in his mind. Uh, Paul wasn't wanting Jesus. He was wanting to kill Jesus' people. If you think this morning that somehow that you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven, if you think you're not ready for God to love you, I want to tell you, you're in the very place that God wants you to be because God wants to love you when you think that you are not lovable. Isn't that good? I don't have to stand up here and preach this morning and say, oh, you got to get your life right. you got to memorize scripture. you got to do all these kinds of things. Uh, to come to know Jesus, here I've got to preach and tell you, God wants you anyways. There's none that are left out. There are none that are too far from God. There are none that done, have done such things. We have all sinned immensely. None of us deserve the grace of God. And yet God is looking this morning in this room in his infinite mercy, and saying, I love you just like you are. Just like you are. He'll take you. So Jesus, I want to have point number one, message number one, is Jesus is building his church. Message number two. Don't you wish all, wish all messages could be done that quickly? Jesus begins to walk with his disciples. He's turned now from Caesarea Philippi, headed back to the Sea of Galilee, about 25 miles, and then another about 75 miles back to Jerusalem. They're walking. It's going to take some time, but guess what? When you take some time with Jesus, and it takes time with Jesus, you can learn something. They needed some time. That's what it means to walk with Jesus, by the way. It means to take time with him, to listen, to be instructed. And so he begins to instruct them. He says, now, he says, uh, 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must, underline, must go to Jerusalem. It was time. It was on God's timetable. That's what's wonderful about tomorrow. Josh uh, mentioned it. There's an eclipse coming somewhere around 2.30 or so. Don't look at it. Unless you have made special arrangements to do so because it will harm you. But you know what? That eclipse is pre-arranged. Do you know they have known about that that, that eclipse coming for years and years and centuries? Do you know that they can predict when the next one will come about 30-something years from now? You know what that means? Somebody said it in order. It could not have just happened. If it was just randomly being an eclipse and you didn't know when it was going to happen again and it just snuck up on you, then you might think, well, this is a random thing. But when it is predictable, by the way, the sunrise is predicted. You know, you can watch and they'll tell you every day what time within a second the sun is coming up and going down, and the moon. You know what all that means? God has a timetable. He created. This is a created world. It is undisputable, undeniable. You live in a created world, and if the world was created, guess what it has? A creator, thank you. It's indisputable, inarguable. He said, I must go to Jerusalem. Now, that wouldn't have been a problem all by itself. This would have been at least the fourth trip they had made to Jerusalem. It was not an unnormal thing, a natural thing for them to do. But then he added something. He began to instruct them, telling them when they went to Jerusalem, he would begin to suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. And then he says, this was totally outside the realm of what they believed could be possible. He said, and must be killed. Whoa, 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 whoa. Just went off my radar, Jesus. Not what I planned, not what I was looking for. Yes, we're going to Jerusalem and we're going to wallop them. Yes, we're going. Remember who Jesus was. They knew who he was now. They'd seen him feed 20,000 folks with just a dab of food. They'd seen folks step from the grave. They had seen folks that had been uh, uh, blind, cured. They had seen folks that had withered limbs, limbs immediately appear. They had seen folks that had been born without limbs have limbs appear. They knew that something special was there. And they were ready to go and take Jerusalem and the Old Testament prophecies be fulfilled and they be set up a kingdom and the Romans be gone. They were ready. They were past ready. And then Jesus said, and be killed. And I want to tell you, That knocked their feet out from under them. They weren't ready for that. See, that's the way God works. We program God. All right, God, I'm ready for you. I'm ready for you to bless my life. I'm ready for you to give me whole children. I'm ready uh, for you to uh, give me a job. I'm ready for you to bring me a spouse. I'm ready for all these things. And then when God does something different, we're all of a sudden not ready. See, because we want God to do what we want Him to do. We don't want God to be God. I might better repeat that. We want God to do what we want Him to do. We don't want God to be God. Because when God is God, He does things that we don't expect. And sometimes, by the way, we don't like. Did you know that? If you're getting saved or serving God because you believe you're going to always get everything you're like, you're soon to be disappointed, brothers and sisters. That's not who God is. God is more concerned about your holiness than He is your happiness. That's worth writing down, by the way. If you'll learn to live by that, your life will change. God is more concerned with your holiness than he is your happiness. We're more concerned with our happiness than our holiness. They'll get up and shout and clout and jump up and down and sing when you sing those little songs that make them feel good, but when you tell the truth, it gets quiet in the house. Say, Bruce, are you get singing? No, I'm for singing. I'm for good singing. I like our singing. It's getting better. 
but I'm for truth. We have to match them together. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed. I'm going to give my life up. That was the plan of God, folks. That's what God had ready. Now I want you to listen what happens. Peter, standing up for the group, but I want you to understand, Peter was standing for the group. It wasn't just Peter. I'll show you that in a minute. I know what happened, by the way, and I've got just a few minutes to do another whole sermon. <laughs> um, they all looked over and said, Peter, you're the big mouth. You go tell him. This is not how this is working out. We didn't give our life. We didn't come and follow you to see you killed. We came and followed you to see you to be made king. You go tell him, Peter. Then Peter felt like he had the authority to call what Jesus just told him. Upon that statement, that thou art the Christ, I'm going to build my church. So Peter said, <clears throat> we'll go set him straight. He went up and said, Jesus, wait a minute. We, we need to have a serious talk, he says. Then, I'm on the 22nd verse. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Have you considered that? Here, a mortal, Peter, wet behind the ears, not knowing the truth yet, he looks at Jesus and he rebukes him. That word rebuke there is a strong word. It is a word that says he vehemently, aggressively abuked him and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, I like the next word, Lord. How do you rebuke Lord? You don't. Not if he's Lord, you don't rebuke him. He began and said, far be it from you. This shall not happen to you. Second sermon, second point now. How many of us have rebuked the Lord? No, Lord. You were wrong. I can't do that. You want me to do what? For whom? Charlie, you want me to join the choir? Lord, you've made a mistake. You know what you just did? You just told the Lord no. And you rebuked him, said, you've made a wrong choice. I want to ask you a question. Has God ever made a wrong choice? I'll answer that for you. No, for time's sake. He rebuked the Lord of glory. The very thing that he came for, he did not know. Jesus looked at him and said, You are thinking with an earthly mind, not a heavenly mind. That's the problem today. When the, when, the, when the things of life come along, you have to be careful that you filter them not through an earthly precept, not through an earthly principle, but through a heavenly principle. What is God doing? What is God up to? I want to tell you something today. God is up to marvelous and mighty things. We live in the end of age. If you will read your Bible, you will find out God is going to do some things that are amazing in this end age closing event. God is going to redeem. God is going to save. God is going to act miraculously. There are going to be mighty, amazing things happening to planet Earth as the Lord plans for His return. You are part of what can be going on during that period of time. But you have to think with a heavenly mind, not an earthly mind. I have never seen a person that was so heavenly minded he was no earthly good. I've heard that accusation, but I've never met that person. I've met multiplied hundreds that are so earthly minded, they are no heavenly good. Sermon number three. Jesus looked at them. He says, boys, buckle up. Get ready. He says, you haven't seen anything yet not only am I going to be killed but you better be ready to be killed also he said you better start valuing your life the way I value my life I had rather be faithful to the will of the father and die on the cross than fail to fulfill the task that I've been sent to he's going to say to, the, to these disciples 
You better uh, take inventory. You better look at your life and say, what God has for me is more valuable than what I have for myself. So he asked him the question, what could a man exchange for his soul? If he gained the whole world, and he can't, would that be a good swap? The answer to that question for the sake of time today is no, because listen, everything here is temporary. Everything. Everything here is temporary, including your life. But your soul will live in eternity forever. Would it be worth exchanging a few fleeting moments here on earth for every pleasure you can indulge yourself with? Would it be worth that to lose eternity and spend separated from God in an eternal punishment forever? Would that be a good swap exchange? And I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, the answer to that question is no. Nothing here will be worth it. Sermon number three. Make sure you understand the value of what you have. Make sure you understand the value of what you have. Now, let me put it together for you. I told you that Jesus is building his church. I told you that he is looking for folks that are either not looking for him, don't think they're worthy for him, or think there's some reason that they can't be found. And I've just told you that Jesus came and died and said, he's willing for you to exchange everything you have here for him in eternity. So we've come to the point of, de point of decision, haven't we? What do I value most? What do other folks think about me? What I might lose or gain here on earth? My reputation? Or am I willing to take a chance, sell everything out, and trust Jesus? That's the exchange. The here for the hereafter. The present for the future. The unwanted for the wanted. Are you ready? Is he worth it? If he is, he's waiting. Now is the hour. Now is the time. He's ready. Are we? Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Help us to look and to see that you loved us so much you were willing to give everything you had, including your very life, that we might have the invitation to come and join you. Sometimes it would mean suffering. Sometimes it might mean embarrassment. Many times there would be trials. But you promised every single one that's willing to come, you'll walk with them and then finally take them to yourself. And there we would have the wonders of eternity 